to introduce our speaker today, uh, Chris Maher. Chris was a Class A operator at the Upper Blue Sanitation District in Breckenridge, Colorado for 13 years, where he earned his master's degree in environmental engineering through the Illinois Institute of Technology. He has been with Clean Water Services for nine years, where he is now a senior operations analyst and a grade four certified operator. Please welcome Chris. Thanks very much. Um, as I was introduced, we're talking today uh, what I'm calling chemical contingencies for the supply chain of the future. Um, I won't mention them all uh, because we're gonna talk about everybody, uh, all the players here within the presentation, but uh, as always, thanks to all the staff at Clean Water Services um, doing all the real work uh, and enabling me to come tell the story. Uh, what we're gonna do here today, you guys, um, a little background on Clean Water Services. Uh, I'll give you the gist of our two large treatment facilities. We'll talk about what treatment chemicals we use there. Um, there's going to be some uh, kind of boring, a bunch of word slides on state of practice in chemical procurement. Uh, we'll try and make that as fun as possible. Uh, we'll have some real fun telling the story of the great holiday bisulfite scare of 21 uh, that kind of precipitated um, rethinking how we uh, look at treatment chemicals. Um, and then my take home messages for you guys. So uh, clean water services um, as an overview, uh, we're just west of the Portland metro area. Uh, that's 12 cities um, in unincorporated Washington County, 600,000 residents that we serve. Um, the two advanced treatment facilities are Rock Creek and Durham, um, two smaller facilities, Hillsborough and Forest Grove. Uh, we actually use chemicals at all those treatment plants, but the advanced treatment facilities use uh, far more. Um, the reason for that is that we have these stringent effluent phosphorus limits, um, almost 30 years of that. Uh, also now we're looking at year round close to complete nitrification. So the facilities, um, Rock Creek, slightly larger, right? Ballpark of 35 MGD on an annual average Durham. Uh, about 25, uh, very similar plants, uh, almost identical. So the liquids process, uh, we go through a primary clarifier, uh, of course, and then what I'm gonna uh, call A2O variants. So different versions of anaerobic and anoxic and oxic zones, uh, all designed for biological nutrient removal. Um, tertiary flock said to meet those uh, Chem P requirements, those uh, low phosphorus requirements using uh, chemical removal, granular media filters, and then we do uh, liquid hypochlorite and bisulfite for the disinfection and the dechlorination. On the solid side, both plants go through a primary sludge fermentation process, right, to drive that biological phosphorus removal, uh, making BFAs there. Um, that's thickened and then fed to the digester. The WAS stream is handled in different ways. At Rock Creek, there's gravity belt thickeners. Um, at Durham, we just fired up a rotary drum thickener project. Uh, also centrifuges used at Durham. Um, that's all uh, in the quest of the WAS strip process. Uh, briefly, the WAS strip process uh, aims to remove phosphorus and magnesium from that WAS stream before it goes to anaerobic digestion. Uh, we hold it for 24 hours anaerobically. Biomass releases phosphorus, releases magnesium. That does not go into the digester to make nuisance struvite. Uh, and instead, that can go for better uses. Um, as I said, we have anaerobic digestion, centrifuge dewatering, um, and Ostara nutrient recovery, right? So that WAS strip uh, and the centrate combined with a bunch of chemicals, uh, and we precipitate. Um, struvite as crystal green fertilizer. Um, Durham, uh, as opposed to Rock Creek, has a fog um, system, right? So we truck in fog to make more biogas. Um, and both uh, plants do cogen for combined heat and power. Um, so treatment chemicals that we use, uh, we use alum for chemical phosphorus removal. That's primary, secondary, and tertiary processes. Uh, ferret goes into the uh, anaerobic digesters for sulfur removal for uh, the biogas utilization. 
Uh, like I said, uh, alkalinity control by lime addition for all the nitrification we have to do. Um, polymer, uh, right, in every dewatering and thickening process to produce our biosolids. Uh, bisulfite for dechlorination. Uh, sodium hydroxide odor control uh, that goes to pH adjust in the fertilizer production. Um, and also now we're doing some sodium hydroxide pH control of our effluents uh, to try and manage uh, copper toxicity. Okay, you try and chelate that copper uh, out to uh, less uh, toxic forms. Hypochlorite for disinfection and odor control, of course. Um, sulfuric acid. Uh, this is kind of unusual one, but in fertilizer production, we're using that uh, to prevent um, the, the nuisance precipitation of struvite in the centrate lines and, and things going through that process, All right? So lower the pH, uh, uh, more soluble. Mag chloride also goes to fertilizer production. We need to supplement the magnesium to make that struvite. Uh, and a brand new one for us now is ammonium sulfate in the disinfection process. So we're doing uh, chloramination, and that is for control of disinfection byproducts. So long list of treatment chemicals that we use. Okay, so that's the background for where we're going now, which is uh, what is the state of practice in chemical procurement here? Uh, Clean Water Services, we run this goal share program. Um, there's a, something out there that needs a little more effort or you want to do something unusual uh, and it's beyond the normal scope of duties and we make that a goal share and we say we're going to make a real effort this year at reducing our chemical costs. Okay, so here's the story of that one and that was in 2020, right, and I wanted to tell you guys about it in 2020, but of course I just couldn't do that and I couldn't do it last year and so here we are today. So we're going to go back to like pre-pandemic for this uh, stuff, so keep that in mind. Um, this was kind of uh, our origin, right? In 2012, um, we, you know, along with the industry, we started looking seriously at, at, at energy efficiency, right? How are we going to get to net zero? Um, so in 2012, uh, what we do is uh, we form the process innovation and efficiency team. Hoping for no grumbles from the clean water services audience. Uh, yeah, that was the pie team. And yeah, we ate a lot of pie in the pie meetings. Uh, but what we were trying to do there is to um, kind of push the uh, generation of these ideas down to line level staff, right? And keep track of all these ideas. How are we going to reduce uh, our energy use, process, uh, equipment, anything like that? Um, we work with Energy Trust of Oregon, which provides rebates uh, and help with these kind of projects. And we did a, a good job, right? So effective that in 2019, chemical spending outpaced the electric bill. And that year was what? Three and a half million dollars we spent, and so that was second only to labor, second largest line item in our uh, operating budget, um, next to labor. Uh, so we make this goal share, and we're going to try and like establish some best practice for chemical procurement. We brainstorm a little list, and we say, well, you know, what are we going to look at here? We can look at our chemical specs uh, that we're writing, how we estimate our use, how we get big competition, contract duration, delivery, price change. Uh, negotiations um, and market research. Um, that's kind of our areas. So here we go. We begin as always, right? Any project with a literature review, we go out there and say, um, great, what does WEF have for me on uh, chemicals, how, how to procure a chemical? Well, what does WEF have on me for like how to feed and optimize a chemical? Couldn't find anything. Right, so really nothing out there. So this is kind of a, a problem for us, right? While we've had this intense focus in the, in the industry for years now on reducing energy and this net zero concept, um, we're paying little attention uh, to the cost of chemicals, right? The financial cost, the carbon cost, the water cost that goes into the sourcing and the mining and the manufacture and the transport and the production of these chemicals. Um, so what do we do? We say, uh, well, we're going to make the information. We're going to go anecdotal. Um, and thanks to everybody on the list, uh, by the way. So we do interviews with um, all the utilities down there in the Portland metro area, uh, up and down the valley a little bit. Um, you can see them all listed there. And we go and interview all our chemical vendors, right? Anybody that we had a contract with, say, we're going to sit down and, and ask you guys. Um, let's don't go through these questions in detail, right? But we sit down and do these interviews. Um, with the gist of it being, 
how are how do you or how do we get the lowest cost? So we go to the utilities, right? And we talk with uh, all these people. How do you bid? How do you contract? What's your contract link? What's your price change clause? Um, how do you spec a chemical, right? So we get all that information from the utilities. We all share in that information. We go to the vendors and we say, what, what would make us get the lowest cost from you? What's the contract link? How often do you want to do price changes? Is there a benefit if we go uh, bulk, if we like? The more we purchase, the better it is. What actually drives your cost to us so we can understand that, okay? So we go and, and compile this kind of information um, and we look at the specs and, and we come up with these ideas, right? So, well, you know, when I got the clean water services, I inherited a chemical spec. I think it was for ferric chloride and it called out that it couldn't be more than 1500 milligram per liter TSS. And I was kind of scratching my head. That's like a kind of a thin aeration base. I'm like, where, where, cause I don't even understand where any of these specs come from. So we go look at these specs. Um, and so there's so much out there, right? There's NSF, ANSI, standard 60. Uh, there's AWWA, right? If you want to pay for them, they'll spec out all your chemicals. Um, but you know, you guys in wastewater, right? We, we kind of share some of these chemicals with the water industry and those have to be specced uh, to a different standard. So can you deal with a lower grade of chemical? If you do, uh, where do the impurities wind up, right? For instance, once we, uh, we're up against copper in our effluent, we go look at all our chemicals. Man, how much copper is in these chemicals? Uh, are we specking our chemicals correctly? Um, Another idea, right? You go to formula. Can you save money by uh, using a different formula? So we looked at this, right? We're using 25% sodium hydroxide. The vendor says, oh, we offer 50% sodium hydroxide and maybe you get less trucks and maybe that saves you a little on shipping and maybe we can uh, give you a little better price. Um, and we say, okay, uh, that's a great idea. Um, what else? <laughs> and this was a big one, right? At 50%, that sodium hydroxide freezes at 58 degrees Fahrenheit, right? And we're all indoor storage and everything. That's fine, but we're dosing it outside. And so uh, the other thing you look at, right? You've already designed and you have a chemical feed system that's supposed to handle uh, a certain chemical. And you say, uh, that means I got to change out all this stuff to use this new formula. It's not going to be worth it. And that's where we came out uh, on the sodium hydroxide thing. Uh, how about substitutions? Is there a similar chemical that would have a lower total cost, right? And this one came up with our alum vendor. And the alum vendor says, hey, as part of your contract, I can come do jar testing and support this and that. And maybe even though, you know, things like ACH and PAC uh, are going to cost more, maybe they perform better. And maybe you can do your phosphorus removal with these things at a lower cost. Maybe you save money on polymer. Um, so you're looking at substituting chemicals to save money now, too. Uh, we, we didn't make any change with alum either. Um, this contract duration and price change clause, this is a big one, right, for the vendors. Uh, also for you as the utility. Um, in our interviews and in our research, we found, you know, one, three, five, I think somebody had a 10-year chemical contract. But you ask the vendor, and the vendor says, you know, a one-year contract is what enables me to give you the best price, right? I can only bet against the market a year out. Uh, Anything longer than that, we're gonna have to have a price change clause. Um, the problem for us, right? That's not an insignificant, you see the list of chemicals? That's not an insignificant effort for the business department to go and bid and contract these chemicals, right? Every chemical, every year. Um, and so you look at what's the options for renewal versus rebid. Um, the price change clause, uh, this is kind of the, the two that we found out there. There's an index-based approach, right? Uh, so you have a commodity. And there's an index that's relevant to that commodity and that index goes up and down and you say, uh, okay, we're gonna base our price change based on the, uh, the change in this market index. Um, the vendor doesn't like it because there's no one index that will accurately uh, you know, collect all the information uh, that drives their price. Um, the index is expensive to uh, subscribe to, right? As a utility, well, you're going to save all this money, but you got to pay $40,000 a year to subscribe and actually get the information. Um, so you can try and push that back on the vendor. Say, if you want a price change, here's the index. I know you got, uh, I know you have the index. 
show me the page of the index that gives me the uh, price changes over the, the last three months or whatever your you know, duration is. Uh, vendor proof approach, right? Some people out there are like, oh yeah, we'll take a price change, but you have to prove to me uh, that your price has changed. And I don't know how you do that. I, you, know, I get your, you know, trust your vendor to uh, provide you the information that says, uh, look, my whatever box site is twice as much as it was uh, last year. And therefore Alan is twice as much to you. Um, so we prefer this index-based price uh, changes. Um, you guys just kind of work with a vendor to agree on an index or uh, maybe two indices that will work for you. Uh, what we came down to was base this price change on the average over the interval, right? So if here I'm looking at a three month interval where I'm gonna do a price change and here's some uh, totally made up values for an index representing my chemical. Uh, so you can see what happens here, right? From May at 351 to August at 327, uh, if I just said, okay, for that time period, the market is down, it's down 6.8%, almost 7%, right? And so I'm gonna tell the vendor, hey, the market's down. I need 7% reduction in my cost. And the vendor is gonna say, I'm out. Uh, if we look at the average, right, that tempers that, right? So the average over that course is two and a half percent. And that's within something, uh, right, the vendor can work with. Um, and so you can see works the same way, right? I have the same numbers uh, in there, the same average change. Uh, uh, that would be benefit to me as the utility, right? Uh, so I come May to August, right? The market's up 4%. And so my next three months, I'm going to pay 4% more. But if I look at the average, I'm going to be on that average of minus two and a half. Um, the other two, right, just look at this, you know, uh, the third one in there, right, I, I put 310 in. So overall, the market is down. Uh, and so the vendor has like, uh, you know, an advantage for that month. Uh, and the fourth example, the same thing, right? Uh, the market goes way up for a month. And that costs the vendor uh, money. And so we try and temper all this stuff out. And we've even talked about, you know, taking this approach and limiting that price change to plus or minus 5%, just putting some hard stops on those. So that's index-based price changes. Uh, the et cetera uh, that kind of came out of this project um, is that, you know, we struggled for years with doing this chemical use estimating for the budget year. We are doing crazy things like, uh, here's my... Here's my use over the year, and I'm going to do plus 1.5 standard deviations, and then I'm going to think about if I can do better or worse. And uh, most of us out there are just doing this three-year average, and I said three-year average. I think that's nice and simple, and probably the best you're going to get to estimate your use for the next year, unless, right? Unless there's some extenuating circumstance that you really think I'm going to use more, I'm going to use less. Um, this one too, I like, right? Most of the vendors said in general and in order, right? Their main cost driver is their overhead cost because they have to build and maintain infrastructure and shipping land, all this stuff just to bring you your chemical. Transportation costs were second, right? Especially now up and down because most of the raw materials were coming from far away. Uh, and then third was raw materials. Um, this other interesting idea that came about was joint pur purchasing uh, through these consor consortiums. Hmm. Um, and so we found this Bay Area Chemical Consortium. And so this is like every water utility in the San Francisco Bay Area and a little bit up and down the valley or whatever they do there. Uh, and these guys all got together and said, we're gonna bid chlorine as one group and that's gonna be bulk and I'm gonna get the best price that way. So interesting idea for us to think about. All right, thank you guys so much for sticking uh, with me through the really dry stuff. Uh, let's have some fun telling the story of uh, this past winter, the great holiday uh, by sulfite scare of 21. Uh, our story starts, you know, uh, balmy de December day, early December, and we're just coasting in into the holidays. Everything's looking good. No problems on the horizon. Here we are out at Durham. Uh, you guys get familiar with the graph, okay? Uh, the green line is how many days of bisulfite you have on hand. Uh, the bars is your tank level of bisulfite. The blue is your uh, plant flow. And the orange line, you don't have to concern just too much with, but that's gallons per day of bisulfite that you're using. All right, so Durham's looking good, right? We're sitting at 40 days of storage. Okay, flows, you know, there's a little peak in flow, not too bad. Um, 
So no problem, right? Here's the process control. Uh, don't judge Justine over at Durham. She has to chlorinate the filters. That's why the uh, chlorine dose is seven and a half, um, but still running a nice low chlorine residual. Bisulfite's under control. Uh, you know, seeing a bisulfite residual, which we always want to do, have to ensure no chlorine. Uh, this is Eric's plant, Rock Creek. Okay. Uh, he doesn't have quite as much storage, even though it's a bigger plant. Um, but he's still at rule of thumb of 14 days of storage on hand. No problem. Uh, his, he's running fine process control too, uh, right? Uh, we're looking at uh, the chlorine residual pre dechlor um, is uh, usually a little bit higher uh, out at Rock Creek uh, just due to the CCB configurations. Um, so there we go. We're going to go do some Christmas shopping. Right, Justine's gonna say, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm coming into the holidays. I'm gonna get a load of bisulfite, right? I need more days of storage, especially because we had a little wet weather event. Uh, flows are coming up, uh, right? So smart, right before the holidays, let's get a truck of bisulfite in. Eric does the same thing. He takes two loads at Rock Creek, right? Right before uh, Christmas, he gets a load a couple of days earlier, uh, cause he sees flows coming up too. and. Now he's got storage up closer to, to 20 days. So we're going in to holiday week. All right, good thing, right? Good thing the process analysts talk. Uh, usually it's gossip uh, this time around. Uh, Justine, right? Justine's over here at Durham, uh, calls up Eric. Are you having any trouble with that bisulfite order? Eric says, uh, yes, I am, as a matter of fact. Right, uh, he gets like unresponsive and long lead times. So Justine says, I'll call the rep. And here's our uh, nameless uh, rep down here. Or just, just <laughs> Justine says, what's up with the bisulfite? Right. Well, well, there's a thing about the bisulfite. What is it? Well, you see the rail car with your bisulfite has broken down. You know, it's an easy fix, but the fixers all have COVID. So I don't know when you're gonna get your bisulfite. You know, if we could get to the rail car, we could put some in a truck, or if we could get another rail car, we have plenty of supply at the plant, but we can't. We can't do either thing, right? So your bisulfite is stuck in a rail car somewhere. I, you know, I don't know where it was stuck. It comes from like states away, somewhere in the Midwest. That's where our bisulfite is, great. Um, but we're going into ho a holiday week here and flows are low. Right, and use is kind of down. Um, Durham, same deal at Rock Creek. We're kind of maintaining, but you don't know when you're gonna get your next uh, truck of bisulfite in. So what are you gonna do? We're gonna make some calls. All right, so here's Bruce. He's a uh, business opportunities. Heidi does purchasing. Uh, Logan does uh, overseas plant operations, right? So it's ultimately him on the line uh, for a, a, a permit exceedance. So these guys start talking on short-term contracts and shipping terms. And in the meantime, right, Logan just sits down and goes to work on the Rolodex. He calls anybody, anybody with a truck, anybody making bisulfite all up and down the West Coast. He's calling 15, 20, I don't know how many people he calls, emails, uh, just going to town on it. Uh, and he gets responses, right? You say, well, well, guess you should have given us the contract, right? You call for your, right? You say, well, who was the second bidder? Call them up. Oh, yeah, now you need my help, right? So you get that. Uh, plenty of people have supply, but they're not, uh, they're not in the shipping business. So you got a truck? Okay, we'll try and find a truck. Uh, what is a truck? Nope, not certified to haul bisulfite. Okay, I guess you're out. Uh, we could do it, but you know, it's incompatible with the chemical that normally goes in that truck. And we just like, we don't want to put that in there. We don't think we can clean it out. So nope, sorry. Uh, as always, right. Somebody gets COVID the certified driver got COVID. We have the truck. Yeah. Nobody to drive it. Um, you know what I learned Logan happens to be like a hazmat certified class, a driver or something. So he's like, what does he say? Oh, can I have the truck? They're like, no, <laughs> no, no, you can't have the truck, Logan. You, we cannot let you drive to California and pick up bisulfite. Um, there we go. 
Uh, plenty of people could do it in two months. All right. Uh, and in the all time greatest, oh, hey, I'm actually on vacation in Dubai right now. You need a truck? She answered the phone from Dubai. No, I don't have any trucks. Okay. Have a good vacation. Kid you not. Those are great. Uh, some more calls, right? So Logan, Eric, Justine, they're all going back and forth. How much you got? How are we looking? What's up with the rail car? Justine's going back and forth with the rep. Uh, rail car status, ETA, everything. Uh, Eric goes to work. Eric calls every like warehouse in the Portland metro area. Got any bisulfite? Look at this. He finds some. He has eight totes, right? Little square chemical totes. Uh, they say we can have five. Okay, that's super, right? I got five totes. That's maybe two to four days supply, right? Might get us through, okay? But you guys know the story so far, right? right. But, the, but the thing is, whoop, they're all frozen, right? So that was the famous five popsicle totes, as Eric called them, popsicles of bisulfite that we got. But we got them anyway, and we brought them inside and thought them out and, and kept them on hand, okay? So I got five popsicles of bisulfite sitting there. Um, the process control, let's don't dwell on. Suffice to say, when this happens, right, you start narrowing your compliance margin, right? You start going uh, lower and lower by sulfite, uh, chlorine residual, by sulfite residual. Uh, both plants uh, tried to do that, right? Another response you can make. At least it's something you can like tell DEQ that you did. And speaking of DEQ, so question comes up, what if we can't? What if we don't get it? What if we run out? What if we can't dechlorinate? Uh, so the first thing, and the first thing we did is that uh, you're gonna file this notice of anticipated non-compliance with DEQ, right? Important just always to communicate with the regular, regular, the regulator, uh, what's going on. Um, then we go all philosophical. Uh, well, is it better to discharge total residual chlorine or E. coli? to the river, should we not dechlorinate or should we not chlorinate, I don't know. So we try and answer this question. So we go take a river sample and run the chlorine demand uh, on the river. Um, and I come up with, you know, this contact time and something around 1.2 milligram per liter demand uh, in the river. Well, that's promising, I guess, because, you know, we can put out a residual of 1.2 and it'll come out at zero and we'll be fine, right? Um, uh, but mixing zone, right? We're only uh, allowed 25% of that river flow um, to mix with. And so we kind of take a look and say at 25% river flow with this demand of 1.2. And then I say, okay, I have a residual to, to do my E. coli of one. Um, and so we make this chart that says, you know, per river flow in this situation, how much can we discharge uh, and, you know, only use up 25% of the chlorine demand in the river. Um, even with 100% of the river flow, you know, you do the same for E. coli. You take some secondary effluent E. coli numbers um, and dump those in the river. Uh, it's not pretty, right? You're over your 406 uh, as, you know, even mixing with 100% of the stream. Um, okay, but at the end of the day, kind of what you come down to is public perception rules the day. So what do you want to say about this situation uh, to the public? You want to say we discharged undisinfected wastewater to the river? No, it doesn't sound good. You want to say there's elevated E. coli in the river? Uh, no, um, you could probably play this one off better. Uh, we have discharged a small amount of chlorine in our treated effluent and it's expected to have no effect on the health of the river. So ultimately the, the answer is yes, continue to chlorinate, minimize your residual. Uh, file your notice um, and turn it over to public affairs, right? Thanks, public affairs. Um, all right, uh, I picked up this tidbit here, uh, actually at Residuals and Biosolids Conference, and I looked into it. Uh, the Safe Drinking Water Act, Section 1441, they told me that uh, provides relief uh, for a wastewater treatment plant if you run into this problem, you can't get chemicals. I said, great. Um, so I looked this thing up, and sure enough, right, I'm included in here as a POTW, along with a, a PWS, public water system. Um, 
Then I get down to the third bullet point and I say, could this actually have helped me out? And uh, when the first line is that the PTOW submits an application to an EPA administrator, I immediately think like, uh, that's not gonna happen in time for me to get a load of bisulfite in. So I can't, I thought this was like, you know, uh, hey, I, this happened, I can't get it, I get regulatory relief. No, this is like, if you can't get a chemical, uh, nobody's going to sell you the chemical, uh, whatever trouble you're having, uh, you can go this route and like, who is it, uh, Department of Commerce, EPA will force the Department of Commerce to force a vendor in your area to bring you the chemical you need. That's the relief you get. But if you look this up, there's some nice uh, supply chain case studies uh, on there, including one from our uh, own PNCWA, Klamath Falls. Uh, and then some more calls, okay, and uh, the conclusion of the story, um, we got to the point where we established a contractor with that secondary bidder, that secondary supplier, uh, they could ship it, uh, we quickly got the contract uh, and the funding approved, uh, and we got two truckloads from that secondary supplier, right, so that was like happy new year, so on the third, right, here on the third uh, is when we get one truckload that we split between Rock Creek and Durham, um, right? So we got a little more supply and uh, right, as always happens, I get a wet weather event to go along with it. So I got to use a bunch more bisulfite. Okay, but I got the second load coming in, um, Rock Creek, uh, same way, right? Got the load on the third. Uh, and then by the seventh, uh, I think Rock Creek got uh, the second load from the secondary supplier. Um, and uh, then we were back on track. Rail car was fixed. Second rail car, right? The backup rail car was filled up and that was shipped. And so now we got bisulfite for days. And we had bisulfite for days, right? So lesson learned was kind of like this, right? I'm saying, uh, right, Justine got, you know, an 11th of delivery and another delivery, right? And now our thinking maybe has changed to that 14 day rule of thumb. I, I don't know. I don't know if 70 days of storage is appropriate. Um, Right, but more on hand for more resiliency. Uh, same thing at Rock Creek. Uh, we get the loads in. We're going to say, yeah, well, let's let's keep inventory on hand. So that was the kind of the, the pandemic uh, lesson learned uh, in, in the story of the great bisulfite scare. Uh, let's see where we're going from here, you guys. Uh, so we're going to start wrapping it up here, uh, if if, uh, if not too soon. Can you give me time, Tara? Five. Okay. Okay. We can do it. Um, so chemical treatment costs dollars per million gallons, right? So I can compare Durham to Rock Creek, who's doing better, who's doing worse. Um, so you guys see, you know, 2019, that's when we did the project, like this is too much. Uh, how can we reduce this? Um, uh, then we look at our chemical unit cost and say, okay, how much of that is contained within just the price of the chemical? And we draw very slowly, sorry, this graph across here. Um, you know, and we saw that 1920, we start to see some increases, uh, 22 in a couple chemicals, uh, 23 is not looking good for the unit cost of chemicals here. Uh, so what are we gonna do? You know, this is all we're trying to compare. I want to see like my cost per million gallons to keep coming down or stay flat regardless of the unit cost of chemicals going up. Uh, so this is, uh, this is where I came out to, right? This was my take-home message number one. We got to get out of this chemical game. This is nonsense, uh, which means like do as good as you can with the chemicals. And so in operations, that's process control strategies, like really looking at flow pacing, uh, narrowing compliance margins, right? With your chlorination and dechlorination. Um, those all happen because there's verified and calibrated residual analyzers that you need to maintain so you don't waste chemical. Uh, on the regulatory side, right, push for limits and permits that require less chemical treatment. Uh, if I can get to 0.2 total phosphorus, as we're doing now without chemicals, do I really need to get to 0.1 by using a bunch of alum? Uh, engineering equipment replacements, for us, that was centrifuge replacement project, got much, much more efficient on polymer consumption. Um, take home message number two uh, is just in the contracting with these one year length, uh, figure out how to uh, get the competition and the price change clauses. Um, and think about this idea of a chemical consortium, right? And we're going to come back to that. And take home message number three 
which is resiliency. Um, so awarding secondary contracts is something we're really looking into now. Uh, I need a, not a backup contract. I need a secondary contract uh, where I negotiate a price and I guarantee that I will purchase a minimum amount from that secondary supplier to keep them happy and keep that relationship in place. Of course, you have to weigh that risk and resiliency versus the cost. Are you gonna pay twice as much for 20% of your chemical to keep that secondary supplier uh, on board? Is that worth it to you? Uh, keep more inventory on site, um, help each other out, right? And uh, this, we learned this in chlorine also, um, that if you have inventory, right, call around, maybe uh, another utility can share that with you. Um, and think about the consortium. We're saying now, right, in the Bay Area, right, they all rest on one chlorine supplier and supply chain. That doesn't make me feel good either. Um, but I think this, got, uh, you know, and then you go, well, this consortium idea, so we all get together, but then we have secondary contracts. And the system's kind of set up now that there's different vendors and people making a living uh, on different sized accounts. And so maybe that's our, uh, you know, resiliency. I don't know how that works in with the consortium. I think there might be time for like one or two questions. Thank you. We've got one minute left. Do we have any questions out there? Thank you. Yeah, with the impending rail strike that might hit on Friday, has, has there been discussion on this? No. Do you feel prepared? <laughs> um, no, we have not discussed it, right? Beyond like trying to manage inventory. Um, Yes, and right now, right, I'd say, right, what do we have? Uh, eight, nine chemicals, backup contracts on four or five of them, like real backup contracts that, uh, that we're like purchasing amounts from. If there's, a, if there's a secondary supplier at all, right? If there's only one person in the game, that's all you got. Um, but, you know, uh, I'll just make a comment on this rail strike thing. That's like communication with your vendor and having that partnership Right, and you would hope that they would say, "Hey, this is this is uh, on the horizon, but don't worry because I got two full rail cars sitting up in Tacoma for you, or something like that." Not usually, but that's like a relationship you need to develop. Yeah, thank you. All right. Thank